Yeah, I'm involved in a lot of different businesses. So some of my businesses are doing very well during this time. Um, you know, like medical companies, for instance, do very, very well during this time. A lot of like consumer type businesses where you're selling products and things like that, they're doing very well because online sales are still strong. For instance, my Airbnb sector is extremely negatively affected right now. So I'm burning, geez, I don't know, like five, six thousand dollars a month keeping that place open with no bookings. It's literally like full stop unless you want to do a long term rental. Most of the rents have actually been paid, believe it or not, from all of the tenants that I've personally placed. I've received rent. We need to take advantage of this opportunity and realize that we're blessed, one, to have our health. If you're healthy right now coming through this, be thankful that you have your health. That's the most important thing. What is up, YouTube? Matt McKeever here. And in today's video, myself and Mike Rosehart discuss the problems or profits of COVID-19. So we kind of have a slogan around here, problems or profits. And that whole idea is that, you know, we can either see obstacles in life and let them stop us, or we can try and find opportunities within those obstacles. That's what myself and Mike Rosehart discuss in today's video. So let's just discuss what's going on with COVID-19 and what new opportunities do we suspect are out there for us investors. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here, and I'm joined again with Mike Rosehart. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about exactly what's going on with COVID-19, quarantine, self-isolating, and social distancing. In particular, we're gonna be discussing what current opportunities do we see, what risks do we currently see, and how are we gonna try and position ourselves to take advantage of the situation? Not take advantage of people, but take advantage of the situation we currently find ourselves in. Hey Mike, how's it going? Going well. Thanks. So maybe before we start talking about, you know, how we're adapting to this environment and how we're trying to prepare for the opportunities that may come, what's currently going on with your business? I know we've heard a lot of information and a lot of rumors about rent strikes and landlords going bankrupt. You know, have you seen a drastic impact on your business so far? Yeah, I'm involved in a lot of different businesses. So some of my businesses are doing very well during this time. Um, you know, like medical companies, for instance, do very, very well during this time. A lot of like consumer type businesses where you're selling products and things like that, they're doing very well because online sales are still strong. Um, my landlording business or my real estate business has different, I guess, pieces to it too. So if you unpack that a little bit, things like segments, for instance, my Airbnb sector is extremely negatively affected right now. We've had to drop our rates considerably in order to get the stays booked. That's a way we've reacted to the situation and said, okay, we're going to be 100% vacant unless we can drop our Airbnb prices maybe in half. And now we're going to be, you know, 90% uh, utilized or, or, you know, occupant. So that's something we've had to do to react in, in the business. Of course, if you're an Airbnb right now, travel is pretty much on a, a van. So I have a I have a, a mansion in Orlando, actually, and that property is completely vacant. So I'm burning, geez, I don't know, like five, six thousand dollars a month, keeping that place open with no bookings. The governor of Florida stepped in and said there are no rentals under seven months. It's illegal, banned. So you can't even sign like a six month contract with a snowboard mm. or something until economic conditions improve. It's literally like full stop unless you want to do a long term rental, um, which then in, in my case, it's a furnished like mansion. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so we're kind of weathering the storm right now with that property. I've got a few other properties here in London that I've converted over to long term rental. Uh, there still are rental opportunities during this time, right? So that's been okay. As far as the segment of my business, that does like flipping and things like that. Obviously those holds are sitting the market. There's not a lot of turnover right now as far as volume goes. So any construction is technically supposed to stop uh, by order of Ontario. If your project wasn't already started, you didn't already have a building permit, you can't continue on. In a lot of cases, trades or sub trades are unwilling to work because they're afraid to get a fine. It's a thousand dollar fine if you're caught, you know, working and there was people calling and reporting like neighbors were calling and reporting yeah so there's a lot of things going on right now that we're trying to force um, business to a halt and so because i run a real estate business like anyone else there have had to been pullbacks and so that meant that some of the contractors weren't able to work on sites certain sites are on a hold thankfully housing is an emergency service right it's on the list of emergency services and so if we're doing unit turnover between tenants that's something we're allowed to still do during this time correct me if i'm wrong um, I, we've done one of those. So, um, yeah, I guess that's something I think we had to do. The person had to move in. It was actually a, like a need. They had nowhere else to live. So I would argue it was an emergency. Mm -hmm. Most of the rents have actually been paid, believe it or not, from all of the tenants that I've personally placed, I've received rent. 
all of them. There have been some tenants I've inherited that have decided they would go on a rent strike, a couple of them, and they're a minority, a very small percentage of my uh, rental portfolio. Mm-hmm. And we're working with them in this time, trying to find a, a solution that works for yeah. everyone. It's, it's not going to bankrupt me because I bought for cash flow and I ran numbers like, what if a unit was vacant in the triplex? Could I still sustain myself or could the, the building sort of sustain? And in a lot of cases, we were, a lot of us were fortunate that we were buying in you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, any of those times you bought, probably even 2019, if you got a good enough deal, you buy enough under market value that even if there's a small pullback in real estate prices, you know, one, two, 3%, let's say short term, we can weather that even a 5% drop in, in price. A lot of us are still above water because we bought it so cheaply or we added value through renovation. And so in my case, most of my properties could drop 20% in value and I would still be making a pretty good profit actually. So it's one of those things where if you insulated yourself, right, and you mitigated risk, and now you're reacting to the situation, um, you can kind of move on. So it depends on the segment of my business you're looking at. But overall, I would say I'm afloat, things are well, I've been blessed the last, you know, nine years, I've been investing in real estate. And so I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling there's a lot more opportunity now Mm -hmm. in this market than there's been before. A lot more investors who are looking to sell property are being very creative during this time. They know how hard it is to get financing during COVID because mm-hmm. the banks have tightened up like a clam. Uh, they're making it very difficult to, to get any financing at all. I'm, this is what I'm hearing from people who are applying. It's They're increasing all of their thresholds and things like you know home equity lines of credits. Some banks are talking about not allowing that for down payments to buy properties. And so mm-hmm. it's a whole, we can unpack a lot of this over the next you yeah. know, 20 minutes. So let's dive into it. What opportunities do you currently see in regards to real estate or small businesses? Yeah, I, I think that um, there's a ton of opportunity in the right segments. For instance, you can imagine, and I don't want to say preying on those that are going through hard times, but maybe actually bailing them out, to be honest. You could talk about someone who's been, imagine someone who were operating a restaurant right now who is just at the brink of like profitability and they're having a really hard time struggling. If they're now forced to shut down and they can't have anyone come in and eat, I'm sure that's impacted revenue in a negative way. And then if you follow that through, like the distributors that were bringing the food to, you know, the, uh, the restaurants, they're no longer needed at this time, right? So there's probably layoffs and probably reduced revenue streams. And so if you follow the whole supply chain, everyone is affected along the way. I'm sure even the dairy farmer that supply the cheese to the restaurant or whatever, they're probably negatively affected. I was reading some articles about that, about people who supplied were just dumping like dairy into the fields because they couldn't even get rid of it all. There was so much. And what we've seen with like, for instance, oil, you've been following oil. People were literally paying you to take the oil. Oil futures were negative, right? So if anyone could actually fulfill those, those uh, contracts during that period, you know, a couple of days ago or a week ago, they could actually get the oil and be paid to take it, right? So there's been times where there are, people aren't driving, so they don't need as much. There's not as much demand for, for oil. And so the, the price obviously falls, especially if you're producing a ton. And right now, you know, Saudi Arabia is producing a ton. So if you're in it for the oil market, um, if you're in the oil market at all in Canada, and I know we're a very natural resource um, mm-hmm. strong economy, right? So we're very much tied and, and the currency's dropped a ton in Canada. The value of the Canadian dollar has dropped a lot on par to, for instance, the United States dollar. We're talking like a 15% drop from high to low in short order of a month or two. That creates a ton of arbitrage opportunity out there. If you're looking to buy a small business right now, you could step in and partner with someone who has a restaurant that was maybe successful before and now they're underwater and they're about to lose you know their lease or they're about to lose something some asset or something's coming down and the bank's still charging them interest let's say you could step in become a partner help them grow their business post covid become a 50 percent partner and help them grow this could be an opportunity for someone looking to buy a business looking to buy a rental property you could imagine someone who owns a building as a small time landlord might own a triplex that has a rent strike going on and long term, this problem will be solved. We will have the landlord tenant board open up again. And it's important to remember yeah. that this will all blow over. Eventually, we will be back to normal. It'll be a new normal, but we'll be back to normal. And so for those people willing to take the risk right now, who aren't sitting on their money, who aren't sitting on their hands right now, there's tons of opportunity. The world is ripe with opportunity for to buy properties, to buy businesses, to invest in stocks. Bank stocks in Canada are trading at half price right now. So if you have some money, you could... You could, if you had some gold or silver, you could sell right now at a high and then invest in bank stocks. That'd be a good example where you get an eight or nine percent yield currently on this current stock price. Plus, probably, if I had to wager a guess, 30, 40 percent appreciation in the next five years, at least on those bank stocks. There's tons of opportunity everywhere. And I think that 
we need to take advantage of this opportunity and realize that we're blessed one to have our health if you're healthy right now coming through this be thankful that you have your health that's the most important thing uh, coming out of this this COVID 19 pandemic mm -hmm. you've been blessed with the opportunity to be healthy to learn to be able to work and, and to grow and so i'm super yeah happy. what do you say yeah, talking about real estate, what uh, what specific opportunities would you be looking for? Or I know the audience is naturally going to want to know what sort of metrics or criteria are you going to use to to determine whether you should buy a property now or whether you should wait six months or wait a year. So you know what fundamentals would you be looking for if you were acquiring real estate? And are you currently actively acquiring real estate? I am actually, I have a, a showing at uh, two o'clock to believe it or not for a commercial property, but, um, so I'll start, start with this. I think that the metrics I looked for before are the same. So things like cash flow and cap rate are very important value add are very important. I'm however, applying a bit more of a discount to the cash flow. I'm applying a bit more of a discount to the forced equity that I can add to a property where I was maybe okay with the pro you know, a property that had maybe 90 cents on the dollar. I might now be more conservative and say I'm looking for an 80 cents on the dollar deal. However, mm -hmm. those are easier to find during this economic time. I think there's a lot less competition. I had investors looking to buy some of my buildings that backed away during due to COVID. And I know they still have millions of dollars, some of these investors. They're sitting on their hands with that money. And so I know the money still exists. And when the economy improves and things are safe and there's a bit of certainty, I think, is the biggest piece that brings, um, I guess, stability to the real estate economy is stability. And, and with, with stability, there is certainty, right? So they're, they're kind of tied. And once we know what the government's going to do, once we know when the economy is back open, which I believe, and I'm, I'm betting on this, that it's going to reopen and it's going to be just fine. I think it's a pretty safe bet to make that things are going to be fine. We're going to evolve. Maybe we'll have more social distancing, but I think that the economy is going to reopen. And so those investors who are sitting on their hands and sitting on their money during this time are missing out on those opportunities. You don't have to compete with that investor that has $2 million cash and the ability to finance anything they want in Toronto because they're sitting on their hands. They're afraid to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So if you are willing to go out there and, and make that decision, then this is the time to do it. You have a lot less competition. So I've been offering on lots of properties. The commercial real estate market, let's be clear here, is in, in the crapper, right? A lot of businesses are not going to be able to pay their rent. There's mm -hmm. already a trend now. People are working from home more than ever. People are switching to online or business owners are switching to online retail and they're realizing they don't need the brick and mortar. What does that mean? Long term in London, we have some of the most commercial square footage of pretty much any town, one of the top cities in Canada for amount of available commercial um, square footage. That was a stat that I saw. So if we have the most and we're seeing a trend going away from eating brick and mortar, away from eating um, office space, what's going to happen is that's going to be sitting vacant or vacancy rates yeah. in commercial space are going to be higher than we've ever seen. So I'd be looking for landlords who have business owners that aren't paying them right now. Maybe they have a, there's actually, I don't want to give away any leads I'm working on, but there are like small shopping malls or things like that you could look into potentially that might be getting almost no rent right now and they can't even afford their payments. And imagine it's just a doctor or something who has this $4 million building and he's like, geez, I can't float this. I can't float 10,000 a month when I'm not getting these rents. And so you can step in and be his knight in shiny armor. He's got lots of money. He can afford to sell for a small discount. He doesn't want to carry it during this time. He doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. Just, I made up this hypothetical person in this hypothetical building, but yeah. imagine going into this commercial or even a commercial mixed use building and now converting it. You can imagine there's a play there where you take the commercial space and you convert it to residential. Instead of having a whole bunch of you know commercial space, you can convert it to a few apartments or micro apartments. That's a huge opportunity because the residential space is booming. People still need a place to live. And so if we see a trend away from needing lease space to rent for their you know business or you know whatever for their office or that stuff's going away there is still a strong demand on the residential side and so i think if you own commercial real estate it might be hard for you in the next couple of years i think we're going to see a bit of a pullback mm -hmm. people are going to expect higher vacancy rates um, they're less sure of the rents that they're going to get uh, all those types of things i think are going to play into affecting value and if there's less demand for commercial real estate then there's less value of course right supply and demand what can we do then we can shift the supply because there's a current shortage in the residential side. So we just shift the commercial supply to residential supply. I think anyone in that business or, or chasing that yeah. revenue model right now is going to be doing very, very well. Um, so that's one one of the five angles I, I made the kind of like a, a game plan or a, a master playbook. When I sat down and had the big COVID shutdown, I'm like, how do I how do I profit from this? What do I do 
to survive this and shift and pivot my business. So mm -hmm. that's the plays I think that are going to do very, very well in this time. Are you willing to share any other pages from that playbook? I'll share that one for now. There's another one I'm working on. I don't want to share anything publicly until I've closed one of the other uh, plays that I'm working on. Sure. Um, so let's maybe talk about other creative opportunities in regards to real estate. Uh, one of my thoughts are we're going to see a softening in prices. Now, how, how that works, whether that's a 5% or much greater, my crystal ball is very fuzzy, so I don't know. Yeah, no but I do suspect that we'll at least see a market sentiment towards softness just as quarantine slowly drags on, right? And in regards to that, I think we're going to see a lot of people that were thinking of selling or that are in the process of selling, they're still going to be kind of sticky to their price. They're going to want to be able to sell for last month's price, not deal with the current reality. And I think we're going to see a lot of buyers come in and they're going to want a little bit more safety or a bit of a discount versus what a property would have sold for six weeks ago versus today. How can investors bridge that gap creatively? I know one of the big things I've been talking about is getting creative with VTBs and maybe some of the terms around that. What are your thoughts? Do you think, are we going to see vendor take back mortgages increase, Mike? And any other creative ideas or solutions for bridging that gap between what sellers want and what buyers will pay? We're also, I guess, limited by our own belief system. And I think cash flow or cash flow tribe opens you up to a lot more possibilities. And uh, I want other people to just even see it, right? So they can believe it for themselves. Even if you think that you know everything about real estate, you don't. You know, like meeting new people, like you always hear different stories. And, you know, like having 15, 20, 30 people different with different mindsets, they have different experiences, you know, like. That's so powerful, and uh, meeting this uh, this people like for me, it's um, it's priceless. It's priceless. It doesn't it, the the twenty five hundred doesn't even come close. At least I've had the mindset change over the last couple of months. I know the questions to ask. I know the things to do. I also have a team behind me that if I don't know some answers, I can ask. And they've been so helpful just to to answer those questions and make you feel at ease. Oh, something that I needed. I found that I already have properties. I was very stagnant. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity. It's just a mindset, right? It's a mindset change. Um, our only limited belief, my fears that I had and how to overcome them. I um, just want to get rid of my limiting beliefs, uh, network, grow, uh, be around like-minded people. One year from now, I feel I will get rid of all those limiting beliefs, start doing more deals, more networking, uh, just completely grow. And I think we're going to see a lot of buyers come in and they're going to want a little bit more safety or a bit of a discount versus what a property would have sold for six weeks ago versus today. How can investors bridge that gap creatively? I know one of the big things I've been talking about is getting creative with VTBs and maybe some of the terms around that. What are your thoughts? Do you think, are we going to see vendor take back mortgages increase, Mike? And any other creative ideas or solutions for bridging that gap between what sellers want and what buyers will pay. Yeah, like during this time, definitely, we're seeing that buyers want the discount. You're totally right on that. And of course, sellers are sticky on their price. They're seeing the comps from two months ago and saying, why would I sell for a loss? I'll hold out, I'll wait till this you know, goes over. We can look to the recession that Vancouver, so the small pullback that Vancouver saw, I think it was in 2017. Uh, a lot of the media right now, if you're looking and you're following the major mainstream media in Canada and probably in the United States too, I don't follow as much there, but we're see I saw a post the other day, like uh, real estate down 60%. And it's almost like unprofessional journalism to put those types of headlines out there. And I think it's actually perpetuating a lot of the fear, perpetuating a lot of the, it might actually push us into a real estate recession. Seeing a lot of these major Canadian uh, news publications pushing out stuff like real estate down 60%. If I was about to buy a property and I didn't know anything about real estate and I saw that headline, real estate down 60%, sales dropping, you know, month over month, hugely. If you look in the, in the actual article and unpack what's actually in there, it's because they forced realtors to only sell essential real estate. You're not supposed to like in certain boards, like in Sarnia, they were actually proposing if you didn't have a legitimate like divorce or like a legitimate need to post then, you weren't allowed to even list your, your property. They, Oreo was pushing down rules for realtors in some cities saying no listings, don't even do 
Uh, don't even take the listing on. So there was a, the reason that the volume is down, right? It's because of the shutdown. It's unfair to say real estate market's down 60%. It's just for that month, volume was down compared to last year, 60%. And so they're taking sales volume and pretending it's sales price. And there's a huge difference there. What we're seeing is that just people aren't meeting eye to eye. And it's because of the COVID shutdown. I personally believe when the COVID shutdown ends and we open back up all the economy, there's a lot of investor demand still pent up there. There's a lot of capital that wants to be deployed still towards cash flow and real estate, especially in areas like London, Ontario. And so I believe that once there's certainty, once there's uh, what we know what's going to be happening, I think that capital is going to pull back into the market. And so probably now is a better time to buy without competition than three months from now. So I think we're going to see a big pullback. And I think it probably will end up bridging that gap because once the capital is sure that it can be deployed safely, it's going to meet the sale price of, of the seller. But it, back in Vancouver, we saw people hold for a full year. We saw the price didn't really drop. It dropped a little bit. And there was tons of articles in Vancouver. People were like, um, Vancouver down 30%. You click the article and be like, it was just sales were down 30%. Prices mm -hmm. in condos were up like 3% overall. So prices are actually going up. It's just that people didn't want to sell for a discount. So no sales were happening during that time. And I think that's more what's going to happen here. Real estate's already fairly illiquid. And I think that during this time, it'll be uh, a lot less liquidity because there isn't a ready buyer there. And sellers aren't willing to drop their price in this current climate because they have cash flow. Why would they sell? If you have a triplex that's generating great income, why would you sell it for a discount? There would be no reason to do that, right? So I think if you're investing for cash flow during this time, it's okay to be careful. Um, but at the same time, you know, obviously look for a little discount if you can, try to find a deal if you can. Um, the second part of your question was on creativity and I haven't hit that part yet. Um, mm -hmm. But being creative, there's lots of ways to be creative. Um, so the, the creative piece could come down to as simple as a vendor take back. You can figure something out. I've seen some really creative stuff where someone had good financing capability. They could get the 80% mortgage from the bank, which is more difficult during this time. But someone who's really qualified could still get a mortgage during this time. So let's say someone could do that and they get 80% mortgage. You could then get a private second mortgage from the seller for 20% and buy for zero down. I feel like any deal right now, even if you're overpaying by 5%, if you put none of your own money down, that's a fairly, um, and you're still positive cash flow with those numbers run with paying the second mortgage, uh, you'd be in a really great position, I think, overall to be buying real estate because long term, we know what real estate does, it appreciates in value. Long term, we know that there's going to be rents paid by tenants. It's a very likely scenario that there will be tenants being forced to pay rent once this all resolves. And so the cash flow will be there. And if you can get a property for none of your own money down, your ROI or your return on investment is infinite. Or even if you can put a very small amount of money down, then your return on investment could be very high. That's what we're looking for during this time is ways to be creative as far as like finding ways to get the down payment or buy with almost no money down. That'd be a great way to be creative. You could buy from someone and structure the terms where they're getting guaranteed interest every month. And so that's a situation where right now, maybe they're not getting rents or something bad's happening it, as far as like their personal um, financial situation because they've lost a job, you can step in and say, hey, I'll provide you consistently $1,500 a month in interest income. No matter what the tenants do, I'll, I'll take that risk on. Let me take over your property at said price and I'll give you consistent interest income every month. That's a good proposition for someone in a recession. Guaranteed money is much better than like potential money, right? So people will take those, those types of um, agreements and those better take back agreements and that flexibility more now than ever, right? Whereas before they're like, hey, I have two other buyers. I can just sell this no problem to someone else. Right now they don't have any other buyers. And so you can go and you can kick the can with them back and forth with multiple offers. It, it feels a lot more like it was a few years ago before the heat of the market. And so, yeah, definitely we can be very, very creative during this time. We're seeing some tons of stuff like that as far as the creativity. Any other ideas, Matt, as far as like creativity? I'm sure you could spark the conversation there. Yeah, I think it definitely just comes down to really drilling into that seller's why. The more information we can gather or gain, the better we're going to be able to craft a win-win offer. And I think there are going to be sellers that cashing out isn't their primary reason for selling right now. It's going to be getting rid of tenant headaches. It's going to be simplifying their life. It's going to be, I inherited this property from my parents. Things like that are going to become more and more common for the next little bit in regards to you know small multifamily real estate. And that's where a lot of investors are going to overlook these opportunities because they're only going to be negotiating for price when they really should be negotiating for price and terms. 
And that's a problem that I've always seen with new investors. But I think particularly in these unusual times, this is the time to really lean in and get extra creative with every one of our deals. So if you're not submitting A, B offers, one that's a cash offer, one that's a VTB offer, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. I think you're doing your seller a disservice by not really highlighting to them the value that we as investors, especially creative investors, place on getting vendor take back financing. Yeah, totally agree. Awesome. Before we wrap up this video, Mike, any other last words you kind of want to mention to the audience in regards to, you know, how they should be preparing themselves to take advantage of these opportunities rather than just wallowing in the, oh my God, the world's ending? I think it's important to remember during this time that everything post COVID will be different, but the same. So there are going to be fundamental changes, I think, as far as how we perceive deals. I think people aren't going to be as bullish as they were before. A, a recession is good at hitting people in the face with reality and, and being less in the dream world, right? People are, are grounded in the fact that, hey, another recession could come. It just happened. Look what just happened, right? So there's there's a ton of that, which I think is good to a lot of investors. I've seen some investors that are overpaying for property. And I think that's going to stop now post COVID-19. I think that's a good thing that people are not overpaying for property. We saw it, Toronto investors coming in or Vancouver investors coming in and buying like a four and five cap rate. That's not sustainable um, in London, Ontario. I think that people were overpaying in certain parts and certain segments. So that's something to be careful of. If you have property right now, just know that this is going to pass. If your tenants aren't paying rent, you'll be able to evict them or you'll be able to work with them and probably get the rent caught up. So that money is coming to you most likely. And just know that if you can't rent a place right now, because no one wants to do showings during COVID-19, that's going to end too. So it's important to remember that the same thing we've been advocating, Matt and I, you know, a year ago, as far as like saving money and investing for the future, uh, having that emergency fund set aside for your property. I typically put one to 2% of my value in my property in an emergency fund in case a roof goes or a furnace. That emergency fund, this is the time to use it. This is the time to hold on and survive through this. Don't make a rash decision to sell at a huge discount just because of COVID-19. So if you're in the middle of like talks to sell your property, don't sell it for 80 cents on the dollar just because of you know the last month. People are, humans in general, are very terrible at remembering like long ago. It's recent events tend to like be heavily waiting on our mind. And so mm -hmm. we feel like the last six weeks is like our entire life. And so we feel like this new COVID shutdown is the new way of life. And we have to remember this is gonna, the economy is gonna reopen, things are gonna improve, things will stabilize. And if you have cash right now, now is the time to probably deploy it. Maybe you could buy you know, one property now and another one in a couple of months, but taking action now, at least you could sort of dollar cost average, so to speak, if this was a bit of a slowdown and things pick up again, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't have a crystal ball, but I have mm -hmm. a feeling that a lot of people are sitting on the sidelines. There was a lot of pent up demand where you're seeing 40 or 50 offers on certain types of properties. That demand still exists. Those people are just in quarantine. So those people will come back. They still have money most likely, and they're still ready to buy real estate. And so just remember that things will recover. It's going to be okay. Think long-term, run your numbers before you make any decisions to buy or to sell. And just know that it's going to be okay. If you have Airbnb properties, that's going to recover too. People are still going to travel. Airbnb is not dead. I saw some posts that like, Airbnb is dead. Like no one's going to ever travel again because of COVID. It's like, I'm already planning my next vacation in, in the fall. So like people are, are doing that. I made a post about a Mexican cheap vacation. I have like a dozen Instagram posts being like, hey, where'd you get that deal? I'd love to get on that right now. I'd like to, to travel. So people want to travel, we just can't because the travel ban. So it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Um, just run your numbers and stick to those numbers and uh, make sure you're buying for cash flow. That's the most important thing through these times. Look for opportunity, think through how this is going to play out and make an educated decision. Awesome. Absolutely. Oh, agree and with follow it. Matt and, uh, and myself and all the other real estate investors on YouTube because we're sharing a ton of good knowledge there. Yeah, absolutely agree with that sentiment. I think it's really important to make sure we don't let our emotions hijack our decision making process during these volatile, uncertain times. Thanks again, Mike. And just as we wrap up here, if people want to follow along with you, if they want to learn more about you or your real estate investing journey, where are the best places to turn to? Instagram. I'm Mike Rosehart and uh, YouTube, just type my name, Mike Rosehart in. I do a weekly stream every Wednesday. That's pretty much all I do now on YouTube. It's just, I got tired of doing thumbnails and editing and I just, yeah, 
I'll just do videos on McKeever's channel for now. There we go. It's a lot of work. I hear you. A lot of props to Matt for continuing through this time. A video a day, that's an ambitious goal, like 365 videos a year. Are you doing holidays too? It's a leap year, so 366. Wow. That's some intense volume right there. I, I was doing a, a two videos a week, and it was killing me. Like, I don't know how. Uh, yeah. I just, yeah. Props to you. Awesome. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Mike for taking the time to shoot this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, smash the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel, and definitely make sure you check out Mike's channel. If you haven't already subscribed to him on YouTube, go ahead and do it. I'll see you guys in the next video.